Guess the city. When Sadie moves there, Dov, her boyfriend, wonders, quote, did she know about the earthquakes, the fires, the floods, the drought, the smog, the homeless, the coyotes, the general sense of looming apocalypse? Did she know that drug stores closed at 10? What would happen if she needed cough syrup or batteries or legal pads after 10? Did she know there weren't any all night diners or bodegas or takeout? Where would she eat? Where would she get decent bagels or pizza? Did she know that the only things people ate there were avocados and sprouts? Was she ready to be introducing? Did she know how dry the air was? And was she prepared for the constant allergies? Did she know that cell phone coverage was terrible? Did she know that no one there read books or went to the theatre or followed current events? That their brains were pulp because they all worked in entertainment and spent their spare time getting plastic surgery and going to the gym? Did she know that no one walked, not even one block, that they drove from their front doors to their mailboxes? Did she still know how to drive? And the traffic? Had she heard about the traffic? Was she prepared to spend the majority of her waking hours en route? Wouldn't she miss the seasons? Did she know that it never rained there? And when it did rain, there were mudslides. Wouldn't she miss the rain? Answers at the end of the podcast. I'm Roger and this is Bookshook and today I'm discussing the first half of September's book Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin, published in 2022. So each month I take a book, split it in two and discuss it on the second and last Fridays. I do a first impression summary alongside my thoughts and reactions and then raise any interesting ideas so far in the novel. But be aware, there may be spoilers. I'd love to share your thoughts and ideas of future episodes, so please leave a comment or start a conversation below, or if you're listening to the episode, send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. Welcome to Bookshook. So I've read up to chapter five called Pivots on page 211. There are some adult themes throughout the first half, suicide, violence, sexism and misogyny. I don't use any foul language in this podcast, but do please check the content of the novel before proceeding. By the way, have you noticed the front cover of the book? It's the same as my Hokusai on the wall. Awesome. The Great Wave. Now, just a quick summary. Sam is on a train station and bumps into an old flame called Sadie, who he clearly fancies. She gives him a computer game called Solution that she has written, and he goes back to his flat, which he shared with Marks, and plays the game. And it's a really good game. So they're college age students. And although Sam has a huge talent for maths, he doesn't love it. His tutor says, quote, you're incredibly gifted, Sam, but it is worth noting that to be good at something is not quite the same as loving it. Now we see how Sam and Sadie met in hospital years ago when Sadie's sister Alice had cancer and Sam had hurt his foot very badly in a car accident. They bond over a Super Mario game and both Sam and Sadie live in different parts of LA. Sam was involved in quote, as I say, a horrific car accident and Sharon, who's Sadie's mum, suggests Sadie continue to play games with Sam to help with his recovery. Her mum says, quote, I know you have to do community service for your bat mitzvah next year, and I'm sure this would probably count. Now I use the word mum, it's not actually used in the novel. There's this very cold feeling creeping in over all these characters I'm reading. At the moment, I'm not enjoying it that much so far. Hopefully that'll change. Now, Sadie's grandmother warns her that there is a difference between friendship and charity, but she nonetheless continues getting the nurses to sign a form saying how many hours she's spent with Sam. Quote, Sadie's community service project went on for 14 months. Predictably, it ended the day Sam discovered its existence. Their friendship amounted to 609 hours plus the four hours of the first day, which had not been part of the tally. A bat mitzvah at Temple Beth Al required only 20 hours of community service and Sadie was given an award by the fine women of Hadassah for her exceptional record of good works. Now, she ends up having a relationship with her computer games teacher at MIT, who she is desperate to impress with her games. One of her games is Solution, which offends her female colleague, Hannah. Quote, 
The idea of a solution was that if you asked questions and didn't keep mindlessly building widgets, your score would be lower, but you would find out you were working in a factory that supplied machine parts to the Third Reich. Once you had this information, you could potentially slow your output. You could make the bare number of parts required not to be detected by the Reich, or you could stop producing parts entirely. The player who did not ask questions, the good German, would blithely get the highest score possible, but in the end, they'd find out what their factory was doing. Fraktostar's script blazed across the screen. Congratulations, Nazi, you have helped lead the Third Reich to victory. You're a true master of efficiency. Q. Midi of Wagner. The idea of solution was that if you won the game on points, you lost it morally. Now, she'd been with Dov for 10 months when she runs into Sam at this train station. We hear how Alice let slip that Sadie was filling out a community service timesheet for her temple. Now, Sam confronts Sadie, saying, quote, you were never my friend. You're some rich a-hole, a volunteer from Beverly Hills, and I'm a mentally ill, poor kid with a screwed up leg. Well, I don't require your patronage anymore. Now, Sadie's grandmother, Bube, drives Sadie to the hospital, but she doesn't get out. Bube understands what has happened. She says, quote, oh my love, this must be a very great loss. She got on her enormous cell phone and she cancelled her afternoon and she took Sadie to lunch at her favourite restaurant, a divey Italian place in Beverly Hills where all the waiters flirted with Frida. Now Frida is the grandmother. They ordered chicken, parmigiani, Sadie's favourite, and ice cream sundaes. The only mention Frida made of the whole situation was when she was paying the bill. Frida says, there are people like you and like me. We have bad things happen to us and we survive them. We are sturdy. With people like your friend, you must be exceptionally gentle or they may break. And Sadie says, what have I ever survived, Bube? And she responds with, your sister's cancer. You were very strong during that, even if your mother and father didn't mention it as much as they should have. But I noticed and I'm proud of you. Sadie felt embarrassed. That's nothing like what you survived. And Bubba says, it is no easy matter being the little sister. This I know. And I'm also proud of you for befriending that boy. Now, I'm relieved to hear that Sadie's sister's cancer has become cured. And it's a bit of a touching speech from Sadie's grandmother. Now, Dov tells Sadie that he's going back to Israel to his wife. She mourns the loss of him. They play Metal Gear Solid together and she feels a bit like the character and realises that stealth might be a good strategy for her in this particular moment. Quote, she would be here in this room with Dov, but she would not provoke him or engage him unless she absolutely had to. Now she's disgusted by the casual sexism in this game, Metal Gear Solid, and there'll be more on that later. Then we go back to the present, after they've just bumped into each other and Sam travels to Sadie's apartment since he has been emailing her and she has been ignoring the emails. He's been imagining ideas about how he can improve her game solution. She's cold when he meets her and appears unkempt. She goes back to sleep and tells him to see his way out. On the way out, he steals a disc of hers that he sees. It's her student game called Emily Blaster, based on the poetry of Emily Dickinson. What a little thief. Now, his roommate at college, Marx, says that she might be depressed and that he should go around to see her every day to show that he cares. Now, to me, my concern is that he may just be an annoying stalker if he does that, but he does anyway. And Marx gives Sam advice such as, quote, get her to take a shower. I mean, really? They've been estranged for years. Come on, reality check, surely. Now, Sam continues visiting Sadie and offering her little tokens of his affection. She does eventually seek medical help for her depression. And when she's better, they promise to always forgive each other if one of them, quote, perpetrates some dumb thing on the other. Now, ultimately, Sam wants to make computer games with Sadie. He invites her to the Museum of Glass Flowers, which happens to be closed. And years later, Sadie reflects that, quote, People once made glass sculptures of decay and they put these sculptures in museums. How strange and beautiful human beings are and how fragile. Now, when pushed to say why Sam wants to make games, he tells Sadie that when he was young and sick, it was an escape. Quote, I could save the princess even when I could barely get out of bed. So I do want to be rich and famous. 
I am, as you know, a bottomless pit of ambition and need, but I also want to make something sweet, something kids like us would have wanted to play to forget their troubles for a while. They decide their computer game will start with a shipwrecked child. Now, Marx is going to be their producer. He lets them stay in his flat and Sadie sublets hers to make some income. And Sam steals a whiteboard. I love the idea of him trundling this whiteboard across the streets of New York. To me, a whiteboard is such a great symbol, particularly in America. It symbolises hope, new starts, creativity, brainstorming. How many movies has some mad scientist scrawling over a whiteboard, filling it with cool ideas? They obviously become famous for this game, Ishigo, because there are future interviews of Mesa, that's Sam Mesa, that's his full name, for example, where he argues against the fact that the Japanese culture was appropriated in his game. Quote, The alternative to appropriation is a world where white European people make art about white European people with only white European references in it. Swap African or Asian or Latin or whatever culture you want for European. A world where everyone is blind and deaf to any culture or experience that is not their own. I hate that world, don't you? I'm terrified of that world. I don't want to live in that world. And as a mixed race person, I literally don't exist in it. Now we hear about how Sam and his mum Anna left New York for Los Angeles in 1984. They're staying with Bong and Dong, Anna's parents, Sam's mum's parents. Now we hear about how Anna had been in the theatre on Broadway. It appears that they moved due to Anna witnessing a suicide in New York, a woman who had jumped from a building. Now Sam and his mum are watching some gymnastics on the TV and he overhears Two men saying that Mary Lou Retton, one of the gymnasts, only won because the Russians boycotted the games that year. Anna delivers a wonderful philosophy when Sam questions whether the men are correct. Quote, It's still a victory because she won on this day with this particular set of people. We can never know what else might have happened had other competitors been there. The Russian girls could have won or they could have gotten jet lagged and choked. And this is the truth of any game. It can only exist at the moment that it is being played. It's the same with being an actor. In the end, all we can ever know is the game that was played in the only world that we know. I love that idea. A competition only being a representation of who is likely the best. It reminds me of a chess tournament I saw on TV recently. There was clearly a slip of the mouse by one competitor, meaning that he lost his winning position. He lost the game, but it certainly didn't mean he wasn't the worst player. And then the strangest thing happens. Sam's father, George, strolls up and makes pleasantries with Sam and Anna. He says very stiffly, quote, If you have time, I'd very much like us to have lunch. You name the day and my assistant, Miss Elliot, will set it up. How cold and informal. And telling his assistant will set it up. How unloving. And all that alpha male wealth signalling. I'm so busy and important, I need an assistant. Don't judge me, but I hate this George guy already. And he's only said 10 words. He goes on, quote, Maybe you'd like to meet my girlfriend. She's a very nice looking woman. I'm not saying this to brag, but to paint a picture for you. It is important to make things visual for people. If you can do that, you'll be ahead of the game, Sam, my boy. But yes, my girlfriend is a very attractive woman. Ahead of the game? What a pillock. That's British slang for idiot if you're elsewhere in the world. Now, Marx does a lot of production help. He funds the broken computers and gets supplies. He's grown to like Sadie quite a lot. He asks Sam whether it's okay if he has a relationship with her and Sam's not too bothered, but he knows that Sadie isn't that keen on him. Sadie struggles with the graphics engine for the game they work on, which is called Ishigo. So, shock horror alert. She gets in touch with Dov. Now Dov caused her to slide into depression. This doesn't sound like a good move. But Sam wants the engine that Dov has made. Sam says, quote, Ishigo, the, their game, is going to be completely original because we made it. If you have access to a tool that will help, there is no reason not to use that tool. Our game isn't going to be anything like Dead Sea, another game that Dov made. So what difference does it make in the end? Now, let's just assess the book so far. I'm finding it a little bit boring, very gamey and techy, and I love games, but no major stakes yet. A bit yawn. I really hope it gets a bit more interesting. Anyway, Sadie sees Dov again. She gets use of this engine, Eunice's, and ends up moving back in with Dov. 
Now I was really hoping this Dov character would be written out of the novel after her depression. This surely is a terrible move. Walking Sadie back to Dov's, Sam slips on some ice. Then we get some of Sam's history. We learn about how this woman who fell from the building in New York is also called Anna Lee. And when his mum asks Anna as she's dying on the ground why she jumped, she says, quote, I didn't know how else to leave. She sends Sam to call for help and the kindly shop owner lets him play Miss Pacman. Quote, Miss Pacman was no different than Pacman, except that she had a bow and was a miss, which in 1984 was an honorific that usually signified a feminist. Anna decides to go to LA after the experience, although she knows there isn't as much theatre for her acting as there is in New York. Roles for people of Asian descent are sparse, and she knows she'll be pigeonholed into playing, quote, Asian hookers in cop shows and movies. Now back to Sam and he's in hospital having hurt his foot. There's melodrama when he doesn't call Marx or Sadie. We learn how he originally was hurt in a car accident when he was young and Marx plays through their game Ishigo, a child of the sea, and he loves it. Sadie is still seeing Dov. She's relying on him for the Ulysses engine he's created. They have sex, he plays the game and is blown away. They declare their love for each other. Now I really hate this Dov and Sadie relationship. It's so uneven in terms of the power play in the relationship and it makes me feel very uncomfortable. Sam and Sadie go with the games distributor for their game called Opus Games and Sadie's not keen on them. For example, they want to classify the ungendered main character as a boy, which irks Sadie, but Sam has debts and he thinks it's a better offer. Sam really does become the poster boy for the game, even though Sadie did all the programming. Quote, the gaming industry, like many industries, loves its wonder boys. And Sadie, next to Sam, quote, felt herself diminish. Now, they make a sequel to the game, and they're required to make a third, but Sadie is resistant. Instead, she comes up with a game called Both Sides, where the protagonist can flip from the mundane world to the exciting, awesome, extraordinary world. It's quite snooze at the moment, lots of boring meetings, no stakes, and I'm still not enjoying the book a huge amount. Now Sam's leg is very bad, he needs to get his foot amputated but is resistant. We find out that Sadie is in a sadomasochistic relationship with Dov, who it seems she really doesn't love. There's talk of moving to LA, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't really care, I hate all these characters who are wildly successful yet miserable. I'm being a bit tongue in cheek. Now they finally do decide to make the move to LA. Sam, Marks and Sadie move out there and Dov is a bit miffed about that. Sam has made the difficult decision to have his foot amputated. But before he does, Sadie gives him the prize for her community service, a paperweight. Sam reflects on his love for Sadie. Quote, he more than loves Sadie. There needed to be another word for it. He also reflects on how amazing it is that they have all moved back to LA. Quote, they had been worried about him and they had wanted to make his life easier. And so they invented reasons, some of them even compelling and real. And they had not done this for the game or the company, but because they loved him and they were his friends and he felt grateful. Now we hear the history of Sam's mum's struggles to gain employment as an actor in LA. She's pigeonholed into quite degrading roles and is violated by a producer during an audition. It's a really horrible situation for her. And then we have a description of how the car accident that killed Sam's mum, Anna, happened and how he got maimed. Sam was only 12. He imagines all the, quote, infinite ways his mother doesn't die that night. If she doesn't take the job and press that button, and if Anna can't afford to buy the new car, there's lots of reasons. He continues to list all the ways that she might not have died that night. Now Sam's surgery is a success, so they're all living in California. They're working on this new game, both sides. In the game, we have on one side, an American called Alice, who is suffering with lung cancer. And on the other side of the game, we've got Rose, who's trying to get rid of a plague infecting her village. Quote, if Rose the Mighty can save her village, then maybe Alice can save herself from lung cancer. The two stories are linked, but proceed along separate tracks. You can only advance in one by advancing in the other. It'll be interesting to see why these two games are linked. Now, Sam suffers from phantom limb syndrome, which causes him great pain and suffering. A girl called Lola phones up Sam 
Now, Lola is an old fling from school who Sam lost his virginity to, although he's never been that much into sex. Quote, Sam did not believe his body could feel anything but pain, and so he did not desire pleasure in the same way that other people seemed to. Sam was happiest when his body was feeling nothing. He was happiest when he did not have to think about his body, when he could forget that he had a body at all. Now, Sam reflects that Sadie has become distant, and it does upset him. Both sides of this game is released and the team celebrate with a drug fueled party. Elements of the story require, quote, giving up in order to move forward. The game is released, but it's not as popular as Ishigo and sells a fifth of Ishigo's units in the first week. Sadie is really hit by the failure of the game and feels very low. Now, Sadie has an argument with Sam. Seems a little bit unrealistic and overblown to be fair very melodramatic, as if the implied author is trying to make a catastrophe between them using mere scraps. One, Sadie complains that Sam takes all the credit for Ishigo. Quote, you let everyone think you made Ishigo by yourself. Two, she complains that Sam knew that Dov had been her boyfriend all along because she had a game of his with his signature. Quote, Sadie looked him in the eye. You knew Dov had been my boyfriend and that's why you wanted me to go to him. You pretended like you didn't. Sam responds with, quote, so what if I knew? Ulysses was perfect for Ishigu. Sadie, this is crazy. And then three, she blames him for her three-year relationship with Dov after the breakup that caused her depression. Quote, if you hadn't pushed me to go to Dov to get the Ulysses engine, I wouldn't have ended up in a relationship with him for three years. Do you know how much power he had over me and how hard it was to leave him? Now, I can't believe she's trying to blame Sam, innocent Sam, for her relationship with Dov. It's her fault. Now, we have a big spoiler alert. Skip forward 30 seconds if you haven't read up to halfway and you're planning to. We, the reader, and Sam discover that she was not depressed due to a breakup with Dov, but due to an abortion she had 11 days before Sam turned up at her room to find her in a really low state. She says that the game Ishigu was about a mother who loses a child. She says, quote, everyone thinks Ishigu is about you, but it's really about me. Sam says, what do you mean? And Sadie continues, Ishigu is about a boy who has been lost at sea, but it's also about a mother who has lost her child. I never had a child, but I might have. She turned away from him. She hadn't told anyone about the abortion, not Dov, not Alice, not Frida. And even now she struggled to say the word to Sam. You can add reader to that list, implied author. Now, obviously, it's a very moving moment in the story, and I don't want to belittle the loss that Sadie must have felt at losing a child, but part of me feels a little angry. Thanks, implied author, for nothing, for not revealing that important information at the time. Now, maybe you're one of these people who love to be kept in the dark about things like this, but not me. It feels like a cheap trick to play on the reader. Rant over. Initial thoughts. It's an okay American coming of age novel. There's no blow your mind poetry or literature. As my mum would say, it's a bit of a blah 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 novel. I hope you understand what that means because it's very difficult to put it into any other kind of words. I'm not really that invested in any of the characters. They're all pretty horrible, especially Dov, and they're successful and fulfilling the American dream, which I find a bit dull. I've read about it so many times. I've seen it in so many movies. Maybe the novel just got me on a bad day. I'd love to know your thoughts. Maybe you loved it. Maybe you thought that Sam and his plight has been beautifully described. Also, there are no stakes. Nothing is on the line at the moment. What am I waiting for? Yet another release of another mildly successful game? Anyway, I guess we've got the question, will Sam and Sadie get it together? But from the blurb, I fear not. Quote, this is not a romance, but it is about love. I don't think they're going to get together. What do you think? Is the book going to be a retort to grandma's expression? Quote, it is not possible to receive charity from a friend. Now, this may be true, but perhaps friends can emerge from charity. The friendship with Sam started with charity from Sadie. She really helped Sam in his recuperation at hospital. And then we have this reversal where Sam helped Sadie in her depression because of a true friendship was built out of this charity. I, I guess I am kind of interested to find out what might happen in the second half, but 
I think the novel could pretty much end there and I'd be pretty happy with it. It was an interesting idea, this charity and friendship. Remember her grandmother saying, quote, friendship is friendship and charity is charity. You know very well that I was in Germany as a child and you have heard the story, so I won't tell them to you again. But I can tell you that the people who give you charity are never your friends. It is not possible to receive charity from a friend. And when the invite to the bat mitzvah arrives, Sam tells her grandfather that Sadie, quote, wasn't a friend, she was just being nice. Let's see how that idea plays out. Throughout the novel, we've got this very strong work ethic. It's a constant idea simmering in the background. When on an internship, Sadie feels bad for, quote, being the first to leave, i.e. at night to go home. And Dov tells her, quote, you're brilliant but lazy. And he also tells her that she should, quote, never ever complain. He represents this ideal that she's desperately trying to aspire to. And Sam's dad talks about how to visualise things, quote, to get ahead of the game. Sadie even uses this language on Sam when he's not feeling his best. She comments continually about how he's not doing enough hours of work, although he is turning up for nine hours. That's not enough for her. So it does seem to have rubbed off on her. The question of identity is interesting in this novel. Sadie is Jewish. Her whole identity is steeped in Judaism and she's often referring to or reflecting on her Jewishness. She did the community service project for her bat mitzvah. She even reads a book on the founding of Israel to try to impress Dov. Now, obviously, identity is very important. It's important in America. It's important everywhere. I've just watched Spielberg's West Side Story, and that is the definition of identity. Two warring sides desperate to claim and wear their identity. Is it possible that, you know, when you've got these perhaps displaced communities, the idea of identity becomes even more important. Sadie and Sam both seem to be clutching and fighting for their identities as Jewish and Korean. And Anna, Sam's mum, talks about the tribalism of LA. Quote, the east side is stay on the east side and west side is stay on the west side. And the east where we stayed with grandma and grandpa isn't the east, it's the west. Because technically anything west of the LA river is the west. Sexism in the novel is touched upon quite a lot of times. When Sadie is playing Metal Gear Solid, she's disgusted by the casual sexism. Quote, And in those days, girls like Sadie were conditioned to ignore the sexists generally, not just in gaming. It wasn't cool to point such things out. If you wanted to play with the boys, they couldn't be afraid of saying things around you. If someone said the sound effect in your game sounded like a queef, it was your job to laugh. And then we also got the sexism of the gaming industry. Sam becomes the poster boy for the game, even though Sadie did all the programming. And remember that quote, the gaming industry, like many industries, loves its wonder boys. And the games company wants to gender their main character, Ishigo. Dov says to Sadie, quote, you know perfectly well that games with female main characters sell fewer copies. Marx's parents are Korean and, and Japanese and Sam's grandparents are Korean. Sadie's grandparent is German. Grandparents are very important to these young people and they figure very frequently in the novel, more than the parents. Sam reads a book on Asians in America, quote, several hours later he had finished the reading which had been about Chinese immigration to America in the 19th and 20th centuries and how Chinese immigrants had only been allowed to do certain kinds of work like food or cleaning and that's why there were so many Chinese restaurants and Chinese laundries, i.e. systematic racism. Now, I wonder if this leads on to the parental pressure that these children are feeling. Here's a quote. Quote, it made him think of his own Korean grandparents back in K-Town and how proud they'd been when he'd gotten into Harvard. They'd put Harvard merchandise everywhere, bumper stickers on both their aging cars. A congratulations to our grandson, Samson Harvard, class of 1997 banner, the bong chai hand quilted. That pride is a wonderful thing from the grandparents, but underneath this loving, there is also a great deal of pressure. Sam is really fitting into a mould of top student that society has generated for young people of his generation. And that pressure turns into guilt when he doesn't call his grandparents. Quote, Sam felt guilty that he hadn't called them, and then he felt guilty that he was failing to distinguish himself in the maths department or in any other way since he'd gotten to Harvard. Sam's never going to live up to these unrealistic expectations 
and pressurizing expectations, surely. Now, Sam draws a maze and his grandmother frames it for Sadie's bat mitzvah. Sam says, quote, her parents can buy her anything she wants. Why would she want some dumb thing I drew on the back of an envelope? I suppose, his grandfather said, because her parents can buy her anything she wants. We have this interesting idea of wealth and love. Wealth has nothing to do with true tokens of love. I like this idea. I also like that it was this token that Sadie kept and kept Sam coming back to help Sadie in her depression. Quote, if he was honest with himself, it was the presence of the maze that kept him coming back. She'd kept it all these years and then taken it across the country with her and moved it from dorm room to apartment. The next time he called home, he would tell his grandparents, yes, you were right, Sadie did like the gift. We've got a lot of Asian stereotyping in the novel, particularly of Anna. In the movies, she'll be pigeonholed to playing, quote, Asian hookers in cop shows and movies. That must be an incredibly tough thing to live with as Anna struggles to find work that's meaningful for her. Now, success and hard work is also an important theme throughout this first half. Sadie and Sam are young and successful. I've read so many American and British novels which seem to encapsulate and promote this quite unusual experience for young people. Dov is a successful games professor and he says to Sadie, quote, you're my most accomplished student. I brag about you constantly. Success really is everything to these people. Most young people are not famous and successful, in this case, game designers. But audiences, I suppose, love reading this stuff. We have such a skewed idea of what our values are to be human. To be successful is to be worthwhile, and we're desperate to read about successful people. Hard work is also an important and toxic theme too, as if hours put into work is some kind of badge of honor. Quote, Sam had originally said he would be back to work in March, but he had not returned full time until May. And even then he was, Sadie felt half there. Sam would arrive at 7 a.m. to beat traffic. And usually he was gone by 4 p.m. to beat the other side of traffic. And Sadie thinks it goes too slowly with him out of the office as much as he is. Now that's still a nine hour day. Give the poor man a break. <laughs> And there's a lot about computer gaming in the book and Sam and Sadie share this love for games. Sam often describes things in terms of computer games. Ma Bong drives, quote, like she was playing Tetris. Her parallel parking skills are that good. All in all, I, I, I'm undecided as to whether I like it or don't like it. I, I'm interested to see what happens with the second half. I want to see if Sam and Sadie get it together at all. That's what I'm thinking. Anyway, I'd be interested in your thoughts of that first half. I'd now like to share some of your thoughts on last month's book, Gargantua and Pantagruel. There are some wonderful comments on the web and on Goodreads. I found this wonderful article by Yvonne Merritt, and I'll put the link in the show notes. It's called The Unquenchable Thirst to Understand, Francois Rabelais' Satire of Medieval and Renaissance Learning in Gargantua and Pantagruel. Here's a flavour of it. Quote, in his book Gargantua and Pantagruel, Francois Rabelais uses satire to address the dislocation felt by Renaissance humanists. By providing an exaggerated fable, comical in nature, Rabelais poses a serious introspection into the extremes of both the medieval and the Renaissance man. More importantly, however, he brings into question his own ideals of humanism. Through an analysis of Rabelais' satirical technique, and by examining his social parody of the medieval and the Renaissance man, we are able to better understand Rabelais' introspection into the ideals of his own generation and to accept his argument that learning is transitory and often a necessary yet futile attempt to understand our world. To understand the Gargantua and Pantagruel, it is necessary to first understand Rabelais' use of satire. As a man whose life spans the transition between the medieval Middle Ages and the Renaissance, Rabelais, as most scholars of the time period, had to cope with a huge shift in thought and ideals. Between the changes in religion stemming from the Protestant Reformation, the changes in education stemming from the popularity of great philosophical thinkers, the move towards science and humanism, and the questioning of the universe arising from the Copernicus's discoveries, Rabelais felt the immense dislocation of his generation. He used satire, parody, and fantasy as a means to cope with this dislocation. Through the monstrous and grotesque comedy of Gargantua and Pantagruel, Rabelais is able to ridicule the institutions of his world without necessarily being offensive. He entices his readers to laugh at the events and human thoughts of his generation. 
Now that hopefully gives you a flavour of the review. It's well worth seeking out. And Ian on Goodreads said, quote, an exuberant masterpiece. This novel is almost 600 years old, yet it's hugely entertaining, far more so than I had expected. In both content and style, there were times when I couldn't have guessed when it was written. It's no longer argued that it was the first ever novel. However, its narrative diversity highlights that the institution of the novel has always been about stylistic innovation, and that there is little that differentiates the origins of the novel from subsequent modernism and postmodernism. And on YouTube, I saw a very interesting interview with the actor Simon McBurney, who said that, quote, Rabelais is necessary. He needs Rabelais. There are certain artists you need, and I need Rabelais. If I'm in despair, I can look at a chapter and immediately feel relief with laughter and release into a sense of freedom. I've put a link to the video in the show notes. It's well worth a listen. He seems to really enjoy the bawdy humanist approach, and some of his readings are extraordinary. Do let me know if you found any good resources for Rabelais. Email me, or if you're watching, put a comment below. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Leave a comment below, or if you're listening to the episode, send an email to bookshook at yahoo.com. I'd also love suggestions for future books to read together. Maybe there's been one sitting on your shelf for ages which you haven't got around to reading, and you just need that push to get started. Talking of next books, after I've discussed the second half of tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow in three weeks, that's the 29th of September, October's two episodes will be about The Machine Stops by E.M. Forster. So get that one at the ready if you can. Also, if you enjoyed this, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe or give it five stars in your episode app. Thank you. By the way, at the beginning of the podcast, it was all about... Los Angeles. What terrible traffic. Anyway, I look forward to discussing the last half of tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow in three weeks. See you then.